Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Sapient. Today on the episode, we have a special guest. His name is Guy Yo, and he is going to, you know, like hopefully give us a lot of information and, you know, just, exp- you know, just give us more knowledge from his experience. So yeah, welcome Guy Yo. Hi, Ganesh. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for being on our show. And I'm doing uh, very good. How about you? Oh, I'm great. I, I just woke up. I think you're getting ready to go to bed. So this is going to be fun. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think so. Because, yeah, it is almost bedtime here. Um, yeah. And I know um, since you contacted, uh, um, you know, I sorry, I contacted you. You know, I have gone through, you know, your podcasts and, you know, I have seen your work. Um, so first of all, you know, I want to congratulate you on having, you know, such a long podcast, um, you know, that is, you know, so many years that you have put into this work, you know, that really uh, shows in terms of how, um, you know, the quality of the sh- uh, episodes have changed recently. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, could you please uh, introduce yourself, you know, like, uh, so that, you know, our audience um, can know, you know, a few things about you? Yes, yes. So, hi, my name is Gayo. I am a former recovering intercourse addict. Uh, I'm also widowed and a lot of other things, but those are probably the two most important things I use to describe myself. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, could you please, you know, help us understand, you know, for those people who are, who are, let's say, you know, like, who do not know uh, what is, you know, an intercourse addict? You know, could you please help us understand that? Yes, yes. So most people would just call it sex addiction or a sex addict, mm-hmm. but uh, sex addiction could take along a lot of forms. It could be pornography. It could be exhibition, voyeurism, um, you know, things related to sex. It could even be masturbation. But for me specifically, my addiction was intercourse. And for the longest time, I had no idea I was an intercourse addict. I just thought mm-hmm. that was what I was supposed to do. I'm supposed to be a man. And uh, the more women you're with, the more of a man I am. That was kind of what was ingrained in me uh, since mm-hmm. my childhood. My background is I am uh, Mexican-American. So my machismo played a big role in my life growing up. Mm-hmm. So um, and machismo in terms of charisma, right? Well, machismo is kind of a, a lot of things all looped together. It's, it's like being a gentleman, being a protector, being a provider, um, some of that. The charisma, I don't think it's natural. I think it's more of just uh, women are attracted to it because it's a uh, hyper masculinity or a lot of masculinity. And as much as we might hear on social media that people are against toxic masculinity, women yeah. do respond to masculinity in general um Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what made it easy for me to be an intercourse addict because people liked that about or women liked that about me that i was masculine or more masculine than my peers Mm -hmm. so um you know at what point of you know like let's say this uh process that you really understood okay this is a big problem now uh it came so oh man there there's so many things that kind of came together, but it ultimately happened when I was uh, friends with the female and was helping her out essentially to kind of stand up for herself. I was going to these group meetings, which is called Celebrate Recovery. And it is a Christian kind of based group that mm-hmm. um, they have meetings for people that have any type of addiction whether it's uh, alcohol chemicals or alcohol drugs sex love addiction which is Mm -hmm. in love with the idea of being in love a codependent Mm -hmm. food addiction eating too much uh they kind of help you deal with all of those things in one place in one location and the meetings would take place kind of where everybody would meet hear a story or hear someone's testimony or hear some kind of uh, christian bible reading and then break off into male and female groups of whatever their addictions is. And so in the conversations or in in those meetings, one guy gave his testimony that he was a drug addict and explained why he used drugs. Every reason he gave was uh, 
something that was similar to mine for having sex because I had a bad day, because I was lonely, because I wanted to feel good, because essentially just not knowing how to deal with your feelings. But at the time, I just related to it. hearing all his reasons for for using sex were the same, or for using drugs were the same reasons I used for for sex to feel better because I had a bad day, and mm -hmm. realizing later. Uh, that is just because I didn't know how to deal with my feelings. And the only thing that I knew was if I had sex, I would feel good when I finished. And mm -hmm. so that was the way I kind of dealt with things. And I used women just for that, to, to feel better. And when I came to that realization, I decided I needed to fix that and work on myself because I realized how badly I treated women in my past. And I realized how I ruined my marriage with uh, my first wife because mm -hmm. I was a jerk and cheating on her all the time. And so started going to, or looking around for therapy because in the celebrate recovery group, I lied and said that I was a porn addict just to, mm -hmm. um, just to fit in because none of the other guys there said they had a sexual addiction. They just had addiction to porn or addiction mm -hmm. to using sex workers. And so I never saw the need to use a sex worker. So I just said, oh, well, I, my problem is porn and, and lied about that and just made up stories just to sit in the room there until the class was over. So I could kind of defend my friend and tell her, oh, hey, we got to go catch a movie. We can't stay that long because if it weren't for me, she would stay there till 10, 11 o'clock at night, helping mm -hmm. clean up, helping out, which is nothing wrong with that. But she didn't like doing it, but she couldn't say no because she wanted um the, the the approval of the people there so she would do anything for the approval of others for um not wanting to disappoint other people mm -hmm. and so that was the whole reason i went and so that's why i lied in the, in the class for the porn mm -hmm. addiction and i was embarrassed to say oh hey actually i'm a poor or sex addict not a porn addict and i need help so i went through uh therapists at first mm -hmm. to kind of deal with this issue and I couldn't relate to them because for me, it was kind of like uh, an electrical engineer and, a, and a, an electrician. So the engineer mm -hmm. knows on paper how to make the drawings, how to make uh, a building, how the electricity it needs. But yes. the engineer has no idea how to put those things together, uh, the easy way to wire up you know, devices mm -hmm. or, or the actual yeah. work going behind it. So okay. that was why I felt like I couldn't connect to them or they couldn't connect with me and they weren't going to really understand me. Even they, even though they knew the proper way to deal with things, for me, it was just, they don't understand. They don't know the truth. Mm -hmm. And so after seeing a couple of therapists, I just gave up on that. I started going to Sex Addicts Anonymous. And in mm -hmm. that group, at least the ones that I went to, it was more of um, trying to live up to the standards of, of the others of like, oh, I'm not going to have sex today because, you know, I don't want to disappoint anybody. And my sponsor's here and they're taking care of me and they're helping me. And I really wanted to have mm -hmm. sex, but I didn't. And so, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was all these other things, but they never focused on the issues. They never tried to fix themselves. They just tried to live up to not disappointing other people. And mm -hmm. I knew that I could live that way, but I knew it wasn't going to solve any problems. It wasn't going to help anything. So I went back to mm -hmm. Celebrate Recovery and tried going through the courses there in a step study group and went through and discovered a lot of things about myself because they kind of actually help you learn what your issues are. So instead of just, mm -hmm. um, why do you feel bad? They ask you, what made you upset? Do you remember the first mm -hmm. time you felt upset? What was the cause of it? So an example would be something like a coworker says something kind of jokingly to you, but they use a tone that's sarcastic or mocking or whatever, and you get upset about it. And mm -hmm. whatever they said isn't something worth getting upset about, but you're upset because if you dig deep enough, it's a tone that mm -hmm. a grandparent, a father, or a mother, an aunt, a cousin, or someone in your childhood used uh -huh. and because you're a child you couldn't say anything against it so you had to live with it and, and accept it and mm -hmm. you know it, it's something that just kind of festered and grew resentment and grew and grew and grew yeah. until you were older so that always makes you upset mm -hmm. when someone uses that tone when there's mm -hmm. no need to get upset in, in a sense yeah. so it forces you to dig okay. deep and be introspective and mm -hmm. that helped me realize a lot of the issues and causes for me wanting to have sex so often and uh mm -hmm 
made me realize, hey, I don't have to have sex to feel good. I can talk about my feelings and work through them and feel good and still mm -hmm. have healthy sexual relationships. Got it. Um, you know, as you said, you know, you recognize it in a very early stage. Um, you know, once you recognize it and, you know, start started acting on it, did you ever, you know, feel like, you know, you were suffering from imposter syndrome sometimes, you know, like, okay, this might not work and, you know, like, um, you know, as you said, you know, because the first set of therapists did not work for you. Um, so at any point, did you feel like, you know, you were suffering from imposter syndrome too? No, because so I, the way I grew up and a lot of the things I've done, I've always had been overconfident in things I really shouldn't be. So I, I understand imposter syndrome, but I don't think I've ever had it because even if I've been in a situation where I realize I'm not qualified to do this, I mm -hmm. have the confidence enough to think or assume or, or make the idea, well, somebody thinks I'm good enough for this, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure it out. And so I, I, if I have imposter syndrome, it might be for maybe five minutes that, that I sit there and then mm -hmm. work through it and rationalize, okay, I might not be qualified to do it, but someone thinks I am or thought I was and put me in this position mm -hmm. to do this. So I'll get it done, find help or figure it out or do whatever it takes to get it done because you know, I, I, I was placed with this trust. Um, on the flip side, I could also be super confident. Oh, I can do it. I'll figure it out. So it, it's one way or another. I don't think I've ever experienced imposter syndrome for a long time or long enough to get nervous about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, once you, let's say, started to go, go through this process, you know, what was those, you know, initial changes that you saw in yourself mentally or physically, you know, that, that you know, made you go like, okay, this is working. Excuse me. Um, I think the first big realization was that women around me liked being around me outside of sex and, and liked being my friend and enjoyed my company because before I would just use them for sex and treat them as objects and, and just use them for my own pleasure and not um, treat them as a human. And some girls like that, some women enjoy that all the time. But not that many. Mm -hmm. Most want to be treated as a human. Most want to have a conversation. Most want to, um, you know, not be used or, or seen as an object or being object objectified. Uh, and those women would usually just stop seeing me after a couple of weeks or a couple of days or whatever. But it didn't bother me then because, oh, I'll find another one. It's, it's not a big deal. I'm not losing anything. But uh, mm -hmm. my biggest realization was I could remain friends with these women for years and decades now, or a decade now, for some of them, and still be able to continue to have sex with them, either uh, down the road whenever they get out of a relationship or uh, whatever's going on in their lives, but still be involved with them enough to know about them, know about their family, their children, their job, their goals, their dreams, and kind of be like a part-time boyfriend and part-time lover mm -hmm. with multiple women because I respect them enough to see them as human after uh, or outside of sex. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, you know, uh, so, um, you know, once you, let's say, you know, started this process and, you know, you went through all of this, um, you know, like, did you have any obstacles uh, especially from, you know, people surrounding you or, you know, were they, uh, you know, like supporting throughout the journey of, you know, this process? Uh, at that time, I was kind of alone. Uh, I was starting to be um, amicable or my wife was, ex-wife was beginning to be amicable with me where we could have conversations with her not being angry with me and yelling at me all the time because, again, we got divorced because I was cheating on her so often and she got tired of it and eventually filed for divorce. Um, and after she got over her anger, uh, we were able to have conversations and hang out and kind of discuss, you know, what's going on because part of the thing is to, part of the process is to make amends and apologize and, uh, you know, try to uh, reconstruct, burn bridges essentially. And in some cases there was nothing I can do. Some people just, or some women didn't want to talk to me at all. My ex-wife, we still had yeah. to deal with each other for, for certain things with the, the legal proceedings and you know, still maintain some type of contact. And eventually, uh, we never had a conversation to where she, for, or if she forgave me, she hasn't told me, but she 
said that her only complaint was that I was a great husband. She just didn't like that I didn't keep it in my pants, that I didn't cheat on her, or that I cheated on her so often. That um, mm-hmm. uh, that and disrespecting her in our, our marriage, that you know people knew about it and she didn't oftentimes, uh, was what bothered her the most. And so I didn't really have any support because she was very... Uh, mistrusting of it because you know she she thought i was trying to figure out a way to get back together or whatever and she eventually believed me that i had an issue and believed that i was Mm -hmm. sorry for it but she couldn't bring herself to trust me again which of course is is understandable and so i didn't have a support system uh in place of people that knew what i was going through and knew what i uh were supporting me in that sense i just had friends that knew that there was something changing in me that I was becoming different and becoming less of a jerk to women and so they'd mm-hmm. want to hang out more and want to you know talk about it eventually they got the full story but when I was going through mm-hmm. it I didn't have like like you were mentioning or asking it wasn't an actual support system it was just help from people here and there that kind of kept me mm-hmm. on track because I enjoyed seeing their reaction to me being different. So their reaction was more positive. So I was like, okay, I need to keep doing this because I like my friends uh, not always making jokes about me, uh, you know, running off to go sleep with the woman or disappearing to go have sex or whatever. So now they're seeing that I'm not being that way anymore. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, Do you think, you know, religion also played uh, any sort of role, you know, in bringing yourself back? Uh, no, because, so I identify as a Christian, uh, just as a Brahmic Mm -hmm. God, but, um, my, my faith is more of just a a one-on-one relationship. I have a, a distaste for Christians in general with the different denominations and all the things and arguing about this and, you know, gays are good or bad, or this is good or bad. And, you know, not paying attention to the Bible itself. So that's that's where I don't have that religious faith in that sense. But uh, mm-hmm. I, I did appreciate that whatever is out there, because I still don't know who is or what is the right God. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it could be anything, right? Um, it's just what I'm used to as an American or as a Texan that that's, that's what we have here. Mm-hmm. But... Um, Yes. I know that there's, I believe there's a higher power because I've nearly died so many times in my life that the only explanation is that there's something out there protecting me. So I don't know if it's a deity mm-hmm. or if it's just a um, supernatural entity or ancestors or who knows, but something is out there that's kept me alive for all these years that I've been here because there's been some situations like one was a head on collision with an 18 wheeler driving uh, about 30 miles an hour with no helmet and that th- there's mm-hmm. no reason I should still be alive after that. So um, in other situations similar to that or as, as nearly as dangerous as that, mm-hmm. and I'm still here. So I have a belief that something here wants me alive. And so I should be a better human for whatever reason they mm-hmm. want me here. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, you do have purpose. Yes. Um, I think that you need to, you know, um, fulfill on your own um, in the life. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, coming, you know, like let's let's say moving forward a little bit. So, um, you know, once you let's say started recovering, you know, completely, um, you know, did you develop a few, you know, habits or, um, you know, like traits to keep yourself in check? Hmm. That's a good question. I haven't thought of that. Usually, or at least now, it's not a, a habit or a trait, more of, I guess, mm-hmm. a standard. So I'm not going to sleep with unattractive women anymore, or at least women I don't find physically attractive. And um, it, it's still a broad range. I just prefer kind of an hourglass figure, whether it's a small, petite hourglass figure or a thicker, heavier set. Um, uh, attractive woman and uh in case anyone want to look up look up uh, we're talking mm-hmm. on the larger size a uh, woman kind of the shape of megan the stallion or ashley graham i think is her name um that's kind of like 
the the larger size that I would go for be attracted to, and then the smaller size would be just a petite woman. But I'm not a I don't prefer smaller petite women. I prefer closer to uh, Ashley or, or Megan. But uh, so now I don't just pursue women because they're attractive. I pursue women or pursue sex as uh, part of a relationship. So I'm not going to sleep with a woman unless I believe there's a possibility for a relationship with her. And I don't mean a monogamous one-on-one relationship, just a relationship where I can keep seeing her for years on end because it's difficult to find one woman that was like my wife mm-hmm. that passed away, where is feminine with me, caretaking, um, basically a kind of traditional mm-hmm. housewife for me, but outside of the home and at work, she was, you know, a boss babe. She was uh, two levels below the the CEO, mm-hmm. CEO level. So she was uh, a director in her field. And so... You know, it doesn't matter to me what they do outside of the home, but having a woman that's willing to be traditional here in the U.S. is is Mm -hmm. difficult to find a woman like that, that is attractive and uh, that is intelligent as well, because I could find a traditional housewife type woman that is not attractive and is not intelligent, or I, I can't find all the things that I want in a woman. So the reason I date this way is I can get pieces of what I want for my own uh, relationship satisfaction Mm -hmm. without having committing or having to get married and risk uh, assets and liabilities and all those other things that Mm -hmm. go on with that got it so um you know can i ask you from where uh from you know which city you are based from currently so currently i'm in reno nevada but originally i'm from houston texas Mm -hmm. so um you know like uh, let's take it to a little bit lighter tone you know, like, you know, let me just ask you, like, what do you like about your own city? Uh, Reno, ooh. Reno, what I like is the temperature. It, it, the temperature throughout the year, the weather throughout the year is nice. Uh, the summers do get hot, but it's uh, we're in a desert, so it's a dry heat. Whenever I sweat, it evaporates. It's, it's cooling. It's nice. We're not mm-hmm. too terrible. Uh, winters are kind of rough. Uh, there, we do get a lot of snow, but it's... Uh, up to a, two feet at a time, but it's never really terrible to mm-hmm. to live in, like other places where it snows. Uh, Houston is is horrendous in in the summer. Uh, it's humid, mm-hmm. it's hot, and it's just terrible. So that's one thing I like about Reno here. And every week, or sorry, every weekend here from starting this weekend until the first weekend in September, there's a different festival, a different event going on. So it, it could be uh, food related, it can be art related. Um, there's a week in August that's for classic cars and there's a week in September that's for motorcycles. So there's always something fun to do here. It's a small town, so you don't have to go too far to get it, get anywhere, mm-hmm. do anything. And the only thing I dislike is the lack of food variety that I'm used to from having been or growing mm-hmm. up in Houston. So, um, you know, like, um so i know just so that you just brought up food um you know like do you really enjoy food or uh, do you just feel like you know i just need to uh, eat to survive oh no i i thoroughly enjoy food i love different cuisines um lately i've been on a key kick on a mediterranean from greek turkish uh iranian um sometimes i go to fall back to german mm-hmm uh russian but here in reno there's not that many choices to have for or not that many um other country cuisines here it's usually just asian mm-hmm. um and not include actually there is an indian place there's two indian uh-huh. places here so if you consider that uh asian I, some places one way some places another but uh there yeah there's not that many variety here it's mostly just asian uh mexican and then traditional american foods and mm-hmm. There was a German place, but I don't know if it's still open. So, it, it, I mean, I, I love food and I love trying different tastes and cuisines and flavors. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's one of the, you know, like finer things of life, you know, that uh, we, we, we have to care and, you know, we have to be passionate at some level of what we, you know, put into our bodies. Otherwise, you know, it, it's just, it just becomes, you know, uh, McDonald's and, you know, just um, KFCs, you know, Crap. just, you know, just mm-hmm. bad food. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I try to avoid those. I, I only go there if it's late at night and, you know, the healthier or better food options are closed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, say after nine o'clock, regular restaurants are closed and all that's left open are the chains like, you know, McDonald's, KFC and other fast food. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I have, uh, because I, I am an Indian, you know, I come from a city called as Bangalore, mm-hmm. um, which is pretty okay. uh, similar to in, term, in terms of temperature, which is pretty similar to your city, uh, but it does not get uh, nearly as the, uh, that much hot here. Um, you know, uh, mm-hmm. so I, I just have this, I, I have heard this from a lot of people that I know I just want to get a clarity on. Is it true that, you know, in United States, Eating out is, um, you know, in, you know, this fast food chains is cheaper than just um, you know, cooking at home? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's cheaper to cook at home. It's more convenient. It is definitely a lot more convenient yes. to, on the way home, stop by and go through a drive through to pick up something to eat and eat it at home. Because, you know, once you get home, it's ready yeah. to eat. And cooking at home, you know, you got to cut, chop, prep. Um, heat, preheat, all the other things you have to do with it. So it's definitely easier, but I don't think it's cheaper or healthier. Um, I can make a a tasty Mexican meal for roughly $10. That'll feed four people two, maybe three times, depending on their mm. appetite. Uh, so, you know, it ends up being leftovers versus $10 just for a meal at McDonald's nowadays. Now, maybe pre-COVID, it might have been cheaper for fast food but uh, now since covid and inflation has been going crazy you now meals and everything are a lot more expensive yeah and you know, since you brought up inflation do you think you know it has personally affected you in some way uh, you know the inflation and you know the broken supply chains and and all these things uh it has it, it's not detrimental to me i i make a, a decent living so but instead of being able to buy uh, four or five of something that I want to get, I can only get one or two and more of it's either a supply issue or the cost is, you know, now say what's something I buy regularly, um, parts for keyboards, uh, switches. So before switches were 20 to 50 cents mm-hmm. each for a keyboard. Now they're 65 to a dollar each, depending on where you're buying them from. And then you have to wait weeks for them to arrive where before we were used to everything showing up in two or three days, mm-hmm. at least here. Um, so, I mean, it has affected me, but it's not, it's more of just me being more selective in what I choose. So now I go out to eat less often and definitely less often to uh, fast food places because before mm-hmm. uh, a meal for three people would be $25. And now a meal for three people is closer to 45, 50. Mm-hmm. It's it's like fifty dollars for three people, is it? Yes, three people and at a, at a fast food place, uh-huh. which isn't that great. And you're, you know, getting fried greasy foods. Mm-hmm. Where fifty dollars, I can go to a finer restaurant or a nicer restaurant, mm-hmm. and you know, get at least two meals, or you know, two people can eat there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think because you know I have been talking to many uh, individuals from United States. And um, you know, uh, many a times the underlying, you know, cause of you know their struggle or you know their headache uh, seems to be this you know this kind of inflation that's just catching everybody out of nowhere, you know, because not not a lot lot of people expected it to happen. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been crazy uh, talking to friends back in Texas and different places in this in the U.S. Um, the one thing I miss about Texas is the gasoline is cheap there. Um, we pay per gallon there, so there it's roughly two fifty a gallon, and here I'm paying four four fifty. So it's it's more expensive here. You said four fifty, is it? Yeah, four dollars and fifty cents a gallon, um, and, and it's you know it's it's a uh, what's it called? Uh, necessary evil. You know, you you have to have be able to buy gas mm-hmm. to, you know, go out and drive. Yeah. Otherwise, you're stuck at home. Uh, yeah, and it's also kind of, um, you know, uh, because before it was um, so accessible that, you know, people have gotten into habit of, um, you know, like just driving everywhere. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, in, in most U.S. cities, there's there's it's inconvenient to use public transportation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, what would take a fifteen minute drive mm-hmm. can be an hour and a half on a bus, and it's not that it's uh, a lot of traffic. It's just a lot of stops. You have to wait for the bus to come around, hop on the bus, and so at least the schedules are, are reliable. Mm-hmm. But even so, you still have to plan for more time to either save money on not spending gas oh. or you have to spend more on gas to get where you want to go faster. Yes, I, th- I agree. I agree about that. Um, you know, because uh, I, I have you know seen many documentaries saying, you know, now uh, mo- many cities, you know, are coming up with, arch- you know, architectural designs uh, and the way they are designing the cities with uh, less, you know, pedestrian spaces. And, you know, that's mm-hmm. honestly concerning because, um, I think you know humans are supposed to walk, um, you know, to at mm-hmm. least a certain extent. Um, where now it seems to be like you know, like vehicle is the only choice of transportation. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's convenient in a sense to get around, but there are cities in the U.S. that are so old that public transportation was a main method mm-hmm. before people had cars. So, the eastern part of the United States uh, and the older cities, like uh, or states like uh, New York, uh, smaller towns like Buffalo in New York, mm-hmm. uh, Cleveland, Ohio, smaller towns, their um, cities are more densely packed. They're smaller blocks, mm-hmm. so each each city block is a smaller, but they're closer to each other. Public transportation takes precedence. Yeah. Uh, the cities and roads were designed for public transportation originally, mm-hmm. and they haven't widened the roads because they keep the sidewalks for people to walk on either side. Yeah. So it's um, better in those cities in that sense, but those cities also get more snow and it gets colder. So that's one reason I don't go to live in those cities, even though it might be cheaper, but it's... Uh, I just don't like having to deal with that much snow. Mm-hmm. And then in Texas, I mean, it's ridiculous. Houston, there's areas, shopping centers that you have to drive to because there are no sidewalks built in. There's areas and parking lot areas that it would be the main store, a huge parking lot, a strip mall mm-hmm. uh, closer to the main street, and then more parking, and then the main road to get there. So it's, it's a huge block and... It's not designed for pedestrians at all. Even if you took the bus, you know, you're walking across parking lots and running the risk to get run over because people just drive crazy there. So it's <laughs> there, there's no good answer for where to live in the U.S. Depending on what you want, you have to make compromises. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, the more I talk to people from United States, you know, I do really realize that you know it is indeed crazy, uh, you mm-hmm. know, how it works to all together somehow. Just like you know, every other country out there, mm, you know, mm-hmm. uh, coming to uh, your podcast, you know, I, I I did check it out, you know, and you have been running it since January two thousand twenty one, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So you know, can you please tell us how was that journey, you know, and what made you to get into you know podcasting? <clears throat> so I'd wanted to get into podcasting for a long time, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in the late nineties, I was an intern for a radio station. Okay. And I enjoyed kind of how things worked back then. And at that time, they were transitioning from analog to digital. So at the mm-hmm. time, it was uh, basically cassette tapes or tape for uh, recording shows. Mm-hmm. Because whenever they recorded, uh, I don't know how radio stations might work in uh, India. I would imagine there are times that a DJ or someone calls in on the radio and talks about whatever. Yes. And so... Originally, back then, it was cut and paste. You had to cut a piece of tape and tape it together with uh, scotch tape Mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, get the pieces together. So the way we would cut and paste on a computer, you had to do it physically Mm -hmm. uh, to get the uh, DJ to get his take correct Mm -hmm. for uh, what he had to do for a remote. If he's calling in, hey, this is DJ so-and-so. I'm over here live at uh, 123 Main Street. Come on down and Mm -hmm. get a free slice of pizza. But he said it right. It sounds like he said it right, but he messed it up a couple of times. He gave the wrong address, so you have to edit that out the the hard way. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was transitioning from that to computers with CDs that had timers on them and 
all this cool stuff. And I just thought it was interesting how radio worked mm -hmm. and then podcasting became a thing and the price of equipment was expensive back then. So I just yeah. never got into it. And, uh, during COVID finally had some downtime. I was at home doing nothing mm -hmm. and thought, you know, what could I do? What could I do? I uh, did several projects, started with woodworking, got back into knitting, all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. And I started getting on TikTok and I saw people talking about um, BDSM and kink. Mm -hmm. And there was, um, there was a, uh, what's it called? A woman that said that she put a dating app or a dating profile mm -hmm that uh, she was into kink mm -hmm. and she started getting a lot of messages where guys would say, Oh, I'm a real dom. I know what I'm doing. You don't need any safe words or, mm -hmm. um, you don't need any safe words because if you were a real sub, you don't need to use them. And safe words are an important part of that community. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've been a part of since the late nineties as well. And this all kind of started or that trend or idea started with, uh, the book and the movie of Fifty Shades of Grey, mm -hmm. where the main character uh, gave the girl a um, safe word. Mm -hmm. She used her safe word, and then he said, no, I don't care what you said. I have to have you. Mm -hmm. And in the movie and the way it's presented to, to mainstream media, most people say, oh my God, that's so hot. That's so sexy that he has to have her. He wants her. Mm -hmm. But in the kink community, that scene is rape because she essentially said, no, mm -hmm. stop. And he said, I don't care. I have to have you. Yeah. And he continued. <clears throat> and so that was also another issue or problem because he's an attractive male. And so there's what's been going wrong. <clears throat> what's been going around back then was called uh, pretty privilege. Mm -hmm. So if you're attractive, you can get away with more things and say more things because, oh, he's, you know, he's attractive or she's attractive. So, you know, they can get away with it or it's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. But if you assume or put an ugly person doing the same thing, mm -hmm. oh, then now it's a problem. Now he's a creep. Now he's a, a whatever, a bad person. Got it. And so that was my idea to start the podcast, to mm -hmm. talk about kink, talk about relationships and get people to understand more about the kink community. Mm -hmm. But then it kind of evolved into um, talking about dating, relationships, sex, and advice in general on how to navigate those things mm -hmm. coming from the perspective of me being an intercourse addict, mm -hmm. knowing how to get with women, but also knowing what's required or needed to have a healthy, long lasting relationship. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like since you have been, you have been running, you know, this podcast for a long time, um, have you seen, um, you know, like the growth that you expected to see it? Um, you know, the, at first, well, actually, no, the, 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 the goal was originally one of these days I'm going to be huge and popular and I don't have to do any work. All I got to do is come in, show up and talk, and then someone else takes care of everything. Uh huh. And the growth that I've had, it's been steady, um, but it hasn't been, um, Exponential. Great. And it's, yeah, yeah I, I wish I'd love for it to be exponential, but no, it, it's hovering pretty low. I think I have roughly about 100 to 150 listeners, depending on which metric I read and, and follow on. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of based on the feedback I get sometimes or messages I get from people that listen to the show, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. And I like the, the size it is now because mm -hmm. I can respond to all my messages. Yeah. And I think for me, that's more important to be able to respond to anybody that reaches out to me versus being so huge to not be able to see or reply to any comments or any uh, messages that I get. So mm -hmm. I'd like to be large enough where I get more messages and that mm -hmm. I could uh, not make money off of it, but at least for it to be self-sustaining because right now it's just money going out. I'm not making any money coming in. There's no sponsorships or Patreon or anything where I'm monetized mm -hmm. to where I can pay for the services I use, you know, like, uh, like the video, like what we're using here, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, paying for those for myself, everything's just kind of coming out of pocket and buying new gear and, and, uh, things to make the show run itself. So yeah, I'd, I'd like it to be to where it just pays for itself is it would be the goal like that. That would be, th that would make me happier. Um, but for now it's just, 
it is what it is. It's hard to be seen or shine through with the podcasting space because, you know, you're competing with bigger names yeah, and, you know, nobody bothers to dive in and it's, it's hard even to get discovered because there's no way to really market because, uh, you know, putting stuff on mm -hmm. TikTok or Instagram, it shows a couple of seconds of a show, but it may or may not be interesting enough for someone to keep watching or to check out the show, but not subscribe, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it also, um, you know, because I have done multiple podcasts before this. And, you know, I have been, uh, by God's grace, you know, I have been uh, pretty good at it, you know, in, in understanding how it works. And yeah, man, you know, in the beginning, it's just, um, you know, as you said, it, it just consumes everything, you know, attention, money, time, mm -hmm. and, you know, like moral investment into it, you know. Uh, so, yeah. I, uh, and also, like uh, you said something about monetization. So, uh, you have you not approached any sponsors or, you know, like you do not want to do this uh, so early? No, I don't want to. I've, I've thought about reaching out to sponsors or, hey, you know, I uh, talk about sex and relationships. So what can I use mm -hmm. for that? But I don't want to seek sponsorships for anything that fits, I want it to be things I actually use and can honestly recommend. I don't want to say, oh yeah, try this new gadget. I think it's the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. And I've never used it. I just do it because someone's paying me to do it. So that's yeah. where I, uh, I guess kind of had an idea that if I'm going to have a sponsor, it's going to be something that I already use mm -hmm. or something that I do want to use or something that I actually, um, use instead of something that someone offers me hey we'll give you a hundred dollars or whatever it is mm -hmm. to uh, talk about our product well what is it i need a sample of it i need to see if it works before we do anything and um you know that whole back and forth i don't even want to deal with that it just wants to be um you know devices that i use or whatever but mm -hmm. again most companies don't want to be associated with you know sex addiction or anything like that you know it's yeah. because um, you know, I get shadow banned on TikTok and I'm sorry, on Instagram, uh, mm -hmm. talking about, you know, different types of sex things and not even showing anything, just talking about it. Yeah. Um, I have to agree with you because, um, you know, no one understands, um, you know, how Instagram really, I don't know, just, uh, you know, goes through the con content and, you know, uh, sometimes they just, uh, shadow ban you and sometimes they even you know like for, go further and just uh, block you altogether just you know for no reason you know, sometimes it does not even make sense at all yeah I mean and lately I've been seeing posts of women that are wearing uh, like see through dresses or tops where you can mm -hmm. see their breasts but mm -hmm. it's not actually showing you anything it's it's covered but it's mm -hmm. it's see-through so you're there's nothing left to the imagination but those get to play and get posted but mm -hmm. talking about sexual positions or sexual kinks and someone reports you and now you're you know you're, the the video gets uh taken down or blocked or whatever and it's just frustrating because you can't get any growth and you can tell your family and friends so many times to check out your podcast, but if they're not interested, they're not going to listen. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's an issue with Instagram. Uh, but you know, like, uh, where I'm from in India, TikTok is banned. Um, so we don't have any access to TikTok here. Right. Um, so, you know, we are more into Instagram and Facebook and all these things yet, you know, even content creators here struggle with, um, you know, policies of these giants because sometimes it, it's just, you know, like not even logical to ban something or, you know, some content, but they end up doing it. But the worst part is the way, you know, the customer care or, you know, their part of, um, you know, a team works that it is very slow and, you know, sometimes they don't even respond. Um, so, yeah, I can definitely understand your frustration with regards to Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can't even imagine. I actually like TikTok not for the content, but just because their their censorship is is the least of all the other content out there. Yeah. Um, for I don't know if you're aware, but there was uh, some stuff going on in France here recently about uh, 
they're essentially riots are going on strike yeah. because of uh you know they're they're trying to change the the law for their retirement age they're trying to make it higher and you know they're they're fighting for that to not raise it they want to keep it where it's at mm -hmm. and here in the u.s no media outlet talks about it no mainstream news talks about it not on facebook you can even search um on google uh france riot strikes 2023 mm -hmm. and nothing comes up it, it's just random uh things associated but not what's currently going on but on yeah. TikTok, you can find those videos and see what french people are doing and going through living there and you know same thing you can look on instagram facebook um twitter also shows some of it but it's for me it's yeah. harder to navigate that uh -huh. but in general it's just um fascinating to me that they're not being controlled by the government at least here in the u.s it, it's it's kind of evident that we only get to see what the government wants us to see or is okay with us seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, we can't, I can't say much about it. Otherwise they'll hopefully ban my own. Podcast. <laughs> I, I, I could imagine. Yeah. The countries are a little stricter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because in India, you know, um, everything is just open and it's like, everything is out there, you know? Um, so censorship is not something that we are used to here. Mm -hmm. um you know because uh you know in india people do complain about you know media uh being uh, censored and all these things and uh, you know when you really look at other countries i'm like you know damn you really know have no idea what is true censorship you know mm -hmm. because um because i think you know knowledge is the greatest weapon that a person can have mm -hmm. and you know by by narrating how they perceive that knowledge you know can change many things um that you know we are seeing right now um yeah anyways i don't want to get into it um <laughs> yeah uh, it was very nice talking to you um because you know even me and i hope my audience learned a lot about you know a lot of things and especially you know this this kind of addiction uh you know and um you know i i have to uh, you know congratulate you because uh, not everyone you know who 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 was an addict uh, you know uh, let's say one time or, or another time you know uh, they are not usually that open and also they are not that honest about the conversation that needs to take place in the society um so yeah i, I really want to congratulate you because um, you know you were just totally honest uh, about it thank you i appreciate that and I'm, I'm glad, hopefully, you know, whoever's listening, you know, learns that they're not alone out there. If they're having something they're dealing with, um, sex addiction, I mean, it's, it's harder to see because, you know, uh, alcoholism or drugs, you can kind of see on their body or in their face or how they act that it's, it's a problem with them. And with food addiction, you know, you gain weight. Uh, the mm -hmm. only two that I can think of that are kind of invisible, uh, well, three, is love addiction codependency and sex you know you don't mm -hmm. see any problems there because there's no physical manifestation other than the person's behavior and you have to know the person to see oh they yeah. disappear to go sleep with the woman or you know just mm -hmm. because whatever um you know you have to know the person to see it so if you meet someone on the street you might not ever know so hopefully someone um listening if they have an issue or a problem that they at least ask for help or seek help or try to find it and hopefully they can get it yeah i mean i think uh, you know there needs to be more awareness about these things because you know uh, society usually shies away anything that's not perfect or you mm -hmm. know um that can be you know like criticized you know they uh, they really don't like it that much um so yeah i think you are doing a fantastic job of you know creating awareness in this particular field and you know if people want to uh, listen to you more uh, where can they find you uh, the easiest way to find me is on my website, S-U-C-I-A-S dot X-Y-Z. Uh, there they can find my social media. They can find my podcast. They can email me or text me. Um, I don't know if you want to text uh, long distance, but uh, yeah, if, if anyone's local or anywhere that just wants to listen or, or shoot me a message or um, complain or have an idea for an episode, whatever, I, I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to talk to anyone. Uh, I don't answer phone calls from numbers I don't recognize, but if you text me or message me on Reddit, Instagram, TikTok, or email, I'll definitely reply back and willing to have a conversation and hear whatever you want to talk about. Yep. 
um sure uh, you know i will also try to drop that in within the uh, you know episode description everywhere so that you know people are able to contact you if they really want to contact uh, you know just get in touch with you and just talk to you or just you know uh, follow you on a regular basis mm-hmm. um yeah so um uh, thank you very much for you know giving us the opportunity to talk to you um you know because we i know i don't understand how uh, you know precious time is um you know because you as um, you know content creator uh, you know of course you do have many things that you could be doing but you know you chose to be with us for you know almost an hour and you know um, you know help us understand all these you know minute things that is not usually talked in on air mm-hmm. yeah so but uh, really thank you very much um, and i hope to you know have you back soon in the future yes i'd uh, love to you know the time permits um so that you know we can talk uh, more and you know we can talk about you know more diverse topics sure anytime uh you you know how to get a hold of me and i appreciate the opportunity too it it was interesting to be able to talk to someone outside of the us and have a different perspective and different questions to ask me about it so yeah i'm looking forward to it yeah thank you very much um yeah so guys this is the end of the episode if you want to follow us you know where to find us and just in the uh, you know in the episode or in the podcast description you'll be able to find gayo's website link so just go there and you know show him some love and also if you if you are interested in you know learning more about these things you know you can just go and you know just follow his podcast because he has been doing it for a long time therefore you know he has more content that you can just absorb so thank you very much guys for you know hanging on till now i'll see you until the next episode bye bye